Our galaxy is the center of the universe, quantized redshifts, say. Now I'll explain what quantized means and what redshifts are. We're looking at a picture of a galaxy which is about 60 million light years away from us. It's a cluster of stars, about 100 billion stars, about 100,000 light years in diameter. You might mention that one light year is about 6 trillion, trillion miles. miles. Right. And this particular one is a Hubble space photo of this object that is 60 million light years away from us. Our nearest neighbor galaxy is Andromeda, looks a lot like this, and our own galaxy probably looks a lot like this. Our own galaxy is the Milky Way, and Andromeda, our nearest neighbor that we can see in the northern hemisphere, is about 2 million light years away. This one's 60 million, there are others many millions of light years away light waves from distant galaxies are longer or redder than normal. You've all heard of Sir Isaac Newton breaking up the light from the sun in a prism and breaking it up into a spectrum of colors from violet to red, a smear of colors. In the laboratory, if you make a spectrum like this with a Bunsen burner, and there's hydrogen in the Bunsen burner, you will see little black lines like this, and those are called absorption lines. Those are where the hydrogen atoms are absorbing light from the flame behind them. And there's a pattern, a specific pattern that occurs for hydrogen. Other elements will have a different pattern. Sodium will have a different pattern, and so on and so forth. So you can tell what element, what chemical material, made the absorption lines from their pattern. Back at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, a fellow named Vesto Sleifer was looking at what they called white nebulae. These are white patches in the sky, and they didn't know how far away these patches were. They thought they were part of our own Milky Way. But he noticed that these distant white nebulae had shifts in these absorption lines from the hydrogen atoms and they were generally shifted toward the red. There were some that were shifted the other way, but most of them tended to be shifted toward the red. So this shift is the red shift that we'll be talking about. He didn't call them galaxies. He didn't know what these objects were. But then a fellow named Edwin Hubble came along about 30 years later in 1929, and he found the farther the galaxy, the bigger the redshift, and this is a figure taken right from Edwin Hubble's 1929 paper, a very famous paper, and this paper changed our perception of the universe. And what he did, Edwin Hubble figured a way that he could measure the distance to these nearby white nebulae, like the one in Andromeda. I won't go into details, but he figured a good way to understand the distance. So he figured the distance of Andromeda. At that time he thought it was of the order of, of a million light years away. And so what I've plotted here along the bottom is the distances on the 1929 distance scale. That scale has changed a bit as astronomers have recalibrated their estimates. But he had a good first start at it. So he plotted these patches, these white nebulae, their distance, and then each dot represents a nebula and its redshift or blue shift. These are the two Magellanic clouds that you can see from Australia. They're right by us. Andromeda's in there somewhere. A little further away, several million light years away, more distant nebulae. He noticed that the farther away you get, the more these redshifts went into the red end of the spectrum. See, I've drawn it blue on the bottom. That's a nebula or a galaxy that is moving towards us. So Andromeda happens to be moving towards us a little bit with a local motion with respect to the fabric of space. And the stretching redshift that we talked about 
is not nearly enough to overcome that local motion of Andromeda towards us. So some of these nearby ones are blue shifted. But after a while, the stretching redshift gets to be stronger and stronger. Now, Hubble didn't know it was a stretching redshift. He thought it was a Doppler redshift, and that mistake has pers persisted down to this day in the undergraduate textbooks. The Doppler shifts are more what make the deviation from this red dotted line. So this one up above the line is moving away from us a little faster than the stretching of space. And so there's a Doppler shift and a stretching redshift. This was astonishing. And so it was then that Edwin Hubble proposed that the galaxies are presently fleeing away from us. And the redshift is a Doppler thing like the the sound of a train whistle on a train that's moving away from us, it drops lower in pitch. That would be if the galaxies were moving with respect to the fabric of space. But if the fabric of space itself is expanding and carrying the galaxies generally along with them, then it's a stretching redshift. Astronomers have continued to measure redshifts and distances. Here's some newer data that continues to support Hubble's law. Here we're on a much larger distance scale in plotting distance out to 300 million light years and the redshifts are larger. Now they're not tenths of a percent but more up to three percent. And the little horizontal bar through each dot is the error in the distance measurement that the particular technique that they're using. There's all kinds of techniques to measure distance and many of them are very common sense measurements like how much light are we receiving from the galaxy, how far would it have to be to produce the light that we're seeing, or its angular size in the sky. And we know roughly how big nearby galaxies are, so if the far galaxy is roughly the same size, then we can tell from its angular size how far away it is. That's just the way people tell how far away telephone poles are or something else. So very common sense ways to measure distance. So those distances are real, but the redshift still persists. The redshift versus distance law. It looks like it's a good law. Now, something else has started to emerge though in the redshift data. Astronomers have confirmed that these redshifts occur in regularly spaced groups. So along the bottom, we have the percentage of redshift, the amount of redshift from what's in the local lab that we see in the distant galaxies. And especially since the late 90s, we have been able, the astronomers have been able to subtract out our own galaxy's motion with respect to the fabric of space. They look at how fast we are moving with respect to the cosmic microwave background radiation, and they can subtract out that motion. When they did, this data came in much more clearly spaced. So here's an example. They will see some galaxies at 0.024%, and in between the next bunch, not very many galaxies are having a redshift in between, and then another bunch at 0.048, another bunch at 0.072%, 0.096%. So the interval there is about 0.024%. Now this, this has been observed uh, since 1976, a fellow named William Tift started reporting this. For a long time people thought it was a problem with statistics, but as more and more workers looked at it and they refined their techniques, by about 1997 the data was extremely clear and nobody was denying the bunching of redshifts. Now the actual redshifts have several sets of intervals, so it's more complicated than I've shown here. But this is a good sample of actual intervals that they are seeing. So this has been developing for a quarter century. They call this quantized redshifts. And there's no longer any doubt about the basic data among people who have studied the issue since 1997. I found that some astronomers stopped reading about it in the early 90s when a negative review paper came out. But then Napier and Guthrie in 1997 had a much clearer presentation of the data. Currently in, in progress are major surveys, sky surveys, mm -hmm. attempting to map the whole sky in 
three-dimensional fashion. Yes. That is primarily just cataloging these objects. Mm -hmm. In order to get this data, you have to look at the spectrum of, of yes. objects. Yes, there's a massive amount of redshift information in some of these deep sky surveys, such as the Sloan survey. So roughly how many objects do we have spectra for? Do you have any idea? Is it in the thousands? I would say it's more than the thousands. So it's a massive amount of Huge data. Huge amount of data. And they're only just now beginning to start to look at these data. They are seeing bunching or clustering of red shifts, even at great distances, bunchings at first sight. This slide shows the red shifts going only up to about tenth of a percent. So those represent relatively nearby objects. Yes. Roughly how far out? So the Napier and Guthrie survey went out to about a hundred million light years. And they continued to see this quantized effect that far? Yes. But a distance of a hundred million light years is actually includes quite a few galaxies. So uh, the statistics are not small even for this distance. The simple explanation is to apply Hubble's law to these red shifts. So Hubble's law changes groups of red shifts into groups of distances. So this interval of 0.024 percent when you multiply by Hubble's constant, it's often written as a capital H, gives you a distance interval of about three million light years. This straightforward interpretation would just say the reason we're seeing bunched red shifts is simply because galaxies are bunched at certain distances from us with not many in-between ones. So this would be three million light years, the first group and the second green group would be six million and the third would be nine million and the fourth would be 12 million. I notice you don't have numbers on the vertical scale here. Are we talking about dozens? Yeah, the, the further out you get, the more galaxies there are at a given distance from us because you've got more volume. The smallest vertical bin might be one galaxy. And so you might be talking several, two or three for the first bunch and so on. Maybe 20 to 30 at the peak there. Yeah, exactly, for the, that distant peak. We're talking about a pretty good yeah. number of galaxies that conform to this pattern. Right. So now we've got the Hubble's law transforming this to groups of distances. What does that mean? Well, we see galaxies pretty much spread out uniformly all around us. So if we just took those distances, one set of distances, and spread them out spherically around us, just conceptually, we would get a sphere. So the suggestion is that galaxies tend to form concentric spherical shells around us. Of course, there are lots of statistics and variations, but statistically what they're seeing, if we transform those bunched redshifts to distances that we're seeing something like this. I've read articles that picture the distribution of galaxies with a volume filled with soap bubbles mm -hmm. where the galaxies would be where the soap film is with essentially voids in the middle of the, the bubbles. Right. So what this is saying is that although that kind of structure may exist on a large scale, very large scale, that we have in addition to that structure, this structure, this kind of cor yeah. these kind of correlations. So you could think of those soap bubbles as having a fairly thick walls compared to the void. And in the walls, the galaxies that we see are having these sets of spacings. The spacing between shells is small compared to the thickness of the walls of the voids. So the larger structure at this point is the soap bubble structure and we find a fine scale finer structure finer scale structure which corresponds to these spherical shells right. that's superimposed on right. this larger structure. That appears to be the picture that the data is giving us. Okay, well this was the simple explanation of the data. What's the problem with that? Well, one is, it says something about our location. If we move away from the center of this set of nested concentric shells, we would see a different set of distances. So here I've got a diagram where I've moved the Milky Way where we are, 
away and you can see the red distance to that galaxy is different than the green one. And I did a little computer simulation just to show the effect on the distribution. So I just took some arbitrary numbers and made them into nice bunches here on the left hand viewed from the center. What we're seeing is distance in millions of light years along the bottom from 62 through 70. And number of galaxies vertically 5, 10, 15. What would happen to those same galaxies at those same locations if we viewed it 2 million light years from the center? That's not even the distance of one of those shells. If we do that, then we change the distances enough so that we see essentially a random distribution. No one would be impressed with the bunching on the right-hand side. They wouldn't say that that was quantized redshift. So it means that if we get more than a few million light years away from the center, this pattern of bunching would dissolve. In fact, if you compare what the probability of us being by accident within one million light years of the center of the entire set of galaxies that we can see, the entire set that the Hubble can see is some a little less than 40 billion light years in diameter. And you work out the probabilities, it's less than one out of a trillion that we'd, we would be that close to a center to see this bunching. That's amazing. That is also the reason why uniformitarians or materialist astronomers don't like this interpretation of the quantized redshift. The reason is that the Big Bang Theory, as we talked about before, can't tolerate a center. Now here I've got the familiar balloon illustration of the Big Bang Theory. Now you have to understand that our universe, the universe we can see, our space, is only the surface of this balloon. And that it's being blown up and expanded in what we would call hyperspace. It's got its space with an extra dimension in it. So to make it comprehensible to us flatlanders, <laughs> you've eliminated one spatial dimension here. So the two-dimensional surface of the balloon is analogous to or represents our three-dimensional space, which you're saying is embedded in a yet larger, larger dimension, a fourth dimension, real spatial dimension. Our experience is only in terms of three spatial dimensions. You've collapsed out one dimension so that all of reality resides on the surface of this balloon. And I do talk about this extra dimension and some of the biblical evidence for it in Appendix B of my book and then the physics of it in Appendix C. I do think there's strong biblical hints that there is at least one extra space dimension like this then time would be yet another dimension, a fifth dimension. But have you ever thought about how God is going to roll up the heavens like a scroll or like a mantle or like a cloak? You have to have a heavens which is thin in one dimension. So using the analogy, the two-dimensional flatland illustration again, our heavens is thick in all the dimensions that we can see, but if it were thin in a, in a fourth space dimension, and it can be rolled up like a scroll. That and other things in scripture hint at it. And in fact, Einstein's theory of relativity doesn't make sense unless you can bend the space in a direction that we can't perceive. So it's so, really so, implied by Einstein's right. relativity. So a fourth spatial dimension is embedded, is implicit in Einstein's equation. Absolutely. It's required. Well, there are some people who would argue with that. If you're going to visualize it and imagine it having real meaning, the only meaning that can be assigned to it is to have another dimension. And when you use the extra dimension, the mathematics of the theory become much simpler. So Einstein's theory has deserved reputation for being very complex, but that's because they're trying to describe the bending of space without the extra space dimension. They tend to transform that away so that yeah. it becomes almost invisible, yeah. not so obvious. Yes. Well, let me just illustrate that again with our flatland illustration. Imagine we had a grid of lines on a flat sheet of paper. And then 
we crumple another sheet of graph paper and lay it over the first. Now, the easiest way to describe the crumpled paper is to take the grid line on the flat paper and add one more dimension, the vertical dimension, and then you can describe the crumpling. But what Einstein did, a little trick in 1917, and what relativists have been doing ever since, is instead describe it in terms of a grid on the crumpled sheet of paper, but at each point you also describe the radius of curvature at each bend. So that requires four coordinates instead of three. The theory has been made unnecessarily complex because a materialist wants to avoid this extra space, which some are calling hyperspace, but materialists are uncomfortable with hyperspace because it says that the space in which we exist, this bent space, is not all of physical reality. If we can't see all of physical reality, who knows might be out there in hyperspace watching us. Right. Maybe God. <laughs> <laughs> so it's an embarrassment to a materialist. Absolutely. The equations imply there's a lot more to reality than we can probe with our senses or with our instruments. Yes. And so John Archibald Wheeler in his book with Wheeler and Thorne and Meisner, big thick book on gravitation, points out how one can simplify the description of the Big Bang by having the extra dimension. But then he's almost pounding the table in his vehemence to say that you cannot actually imagine that extra dimension is real. <laughs> it's just a mathematical convenience, he says. <laughs> but the equations, to me, the equations say that this is real. Absolutely. What gives me a special confidence is that the biblical hints that it is real too. You might mention that passage in Ephesians that Paul just routinely in talking about the love of God, the height, and depth, and breadth, and, and width, and width, four dimensions he mentions, just routinely, yeah. as if yeah, I mean, everyone should know this. Yeah. <laughs> And one exciting possibility to me is that if you include this fourth dimension, that heaven may be extremely close by. That's right. It could be as close as just outside Flatland. Instead of being light years away, that heaven may be... Right next door. Just right next door. Yes, I agree with that. One hint of this is in the book of Daniel, where... Uh, at the Feast of Belshazzar, Belshazzar saw a hand emerge. The word is, came out from, and it doesn't say from where, but he saw a hand emerge from somewhere, where? Hyperspace maybe? And he saw the back of the hand. And something about that made his knees knock and frightened him immensely. And I think he was seeing a cross-section of a human hand moving back and forth with living blood vessels. It was the hand of Christ there, I think. But nonetheless, emerge from where? That implies another dimension. And that, that's another biblical hint of an extra space dimension. And the Big Bang makes the most sense with the extra dimension. You see all the galaxies placed along the surface of that balloon. Our space is only the surface. There's no center on the surface. My theory would take those galaxies and bring them over to, say, one side of the balloon, and then there would be a big dent in it. And that dent would be gravity and gravitation. and The part of space that actually has galaxies in it would just be a patch on this balloon. Yes. But the real important point is that the Big Bang Theory can't tolerate a center. If there were a unique place there, then we'd have to say we were near it. You can't draw a circle around any of those galaxies. There will always be galaxies outside of it on the other side of the boundary you make. So they're not clustered together enough to draw a boundary around, <clears throat> so then you can't have a center. So the Big Bang Theory can't tolerate a center, but we're seeing evidence for one, the redshift data. So our central position is scientifically important. The quantized redshifts are evidence against the Big Bang Theory. We're at this geometric center where we're surrounded by many 
spherical shells of galaxies and it's four cosmos with a center. Now mine is not the only one that has a center. Robert Gentry has one where he has the galaxies orbiting at all different orbital angles, but they're orbiting and uh, his I think is a viable one with suitable uh, modifications. I think we're at the beginning of creationist cosmology, so I want to urge people to keep wide open on the issues and look for better models all the time. Our central position is also spiritually important. Why? Because it refutes secularists. Carl Sagan wrote a book called The Pale Blue Dot, and he over and over talks about the pale blue dot, a, a picture taken from Voyager of the Earth when Voyager was very far from us. His whole book is sort of a pagan poem to uh, the idea that our existence is meaningless, we're not in a special position in the cosmos, and he has this little phrase, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the cosmos. A direct assault on God Absolutely. and his purposes for us. Yes. Our central position affirms scripture because you'll notice the earth is extremely central to scripture. It's the first thing mentioned in Genesis 1, the fourth day of creation, sun, moon, and stars are created then, but the earth is first. So this planet that we're on is the oldest piece of real estate in the universe. And then in Genesis 1, 6, making the earth in the midst of all the rest of the matter of the universe, which was then water, and then apparently he converted it to other stuff. Then you think about what happened after Genesis 1. We had the fall of one man disobeyed God in one respect. It says, as a result, God placed the whole universe under a curse. The ground was cursed, the vegetation were cursed, the animals were cursed, we were cursed by God in Genesis chapter 3. And Romans 8, verses 20 and 22 says that the whole creation groans and travails because of the sin of one man in one location in the universe, uh, it was subjected to futility at that time. But it says it's looking forward to a redemption based on what the Creator did when He came to this one planet to restore not only us, but the whole creation. For 400 years, the secularists have been trying to push us away from the center and then finally denying a center altogether. And now we have some evidence that at least our galaxy is near the center of the universe. So we are in some very special location, prime real estate. These quantized redshifts, they restore mankind to a central place in the cosmos. It's, the cosmos is awesomely big. It's really huge. But God put us in a special place right near the center. Psalm 8, when I consider the heavens, what is man that thou art mindful of him? With this new evidence, God pointed to our location and said that he is mindful of us. The fact that man is extremely central to God's plans for all eternity. We become sons and daughters of the living God. The implications are staggering. They are students who feel so alienated as they study the cosmos in all its vastness. And to think that we're just at some random point in it all, how could we be important? Yes. person who studies the cosmos without a biblical base like this can lose himself intellectually in it and think that we aren't important. They think that the Bible is wrong to say that we're in an important place. No one should have any fear of finding out the truth about what's out there in the cosmos. The more scientific truth we find about it, the harder it is to be a secularist and the easier it is to be a believer in a straightforward Bible.